Hi, my name is Adrienne Aursler, and I want to welcome you to the Brookside campus of Christ Community Church. Here at Brookside, we love to pray for you during the week in our weekly meetings. So if you go online, you can find a prayer card and fill that out for us so that we know how to pray for your needs. We also have a connect card online. And if you're new with us and you've never been here before, we'd love for you to fill it out so we can get to know you and know how to serve you better. Also this week, we have community groups starting. So if you're not plugged in yet, you can reach out to Holly Justice and she'd be glad to get you connected. We also have men's and women's Bible study starting this week. So if you're not connected there as well, you can go online and serve up and sign up for those. We also have our congregational meeting this night, tonight at six o'clock p.m. And this is at our Leewood campus. It's gonna be an outdoor service. You can also check that out online if you want, um, if you're not ready to come in person. So we'd love for you to come to any of those events and please sign up um, for the men's and women's Bible studies. It'll be a great um, fall, especially with COVID going on. So we'd love for you to do that. My sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a day. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me. No more. Shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested in my life, he gave. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began.
Church, my name is Lisa, and the scripture reading for today comes from Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It was 19 years ago uh, this month that I showed up in Kansas City for the first time as a freshman uh, attending Calvary Bible College here in Kansas City. And I was excited and nervous to start this new endeavor as a student in college. I was uh, working with, uh, you know, excited to get professors um, met, to buy my books, to engage in this new activity of learning as a, as a college freshman on this new journey. And I anticipated that it would be the sort of the left brain, slow track, active cognition work that would be the 
most influential in my time at college, that what took place in the classroom and the library would be the most important part of my education. That's why I was going to college, right? But little did I know that it would be the dorm room and the cafeteria that would have as much influence on who I became as a pastor and the person I was becoming in college, just as much, if not more, than the time I spent in the classroom and the library. In my first week of living in the dorms at Calvary Bible College, I met two men, uh, Tim Erickson and John Chadbourne. Here's a, a picture of them. That's actually uh, a picture of the three of us uh, at our senior year of college at a graduation event. Uh, that was our, our senior year, clearly over the years of our formation. Uh, it wasn't in fashion. We weren't helping each other grow in that way. Uh, we actually planned uh, to dress all alike for that party. That's where we were at that point. Just just being honest, that's where we were. And uh, we, we became fast friends in those first month of college and continued to journey all four years of college together, the best of friends. And my relationship with them changed me and formed me as much as my learning of Greek or of my writing of theology papers did. And even just this past year when my friend Tim, when his brother passed away of brain cancer, we were there together. I went to the funeral. John called in. When John took a new role in the middle of a global pandemic, leading a church as a senior pastor, Tim and I were there on the phone with him, on the video call with him, processing what is it like? What do you need? How can we pray for you? Uh, those two men, Tim and John, they know my faults, my failings, just about as well as any human being who knows me. And our love and commitment to one another, our friendship over the past almost 20 years, over that extended period of time, has changed us, has formed us. Do you have friends like that? And whether you do or not, I hope you do, but whether you do or not, I, I suspect that for all of us, somewhere hidden deep down inside of us is a desire for that. I hope that, that you want that. And even if you've been hurt in relationships, even if friends have turned their back on you, even if we've never been good at making friends or feeling like belonging to something or a group of people is something that's really hard for us, even if we've tried to shut that down and ignore it because we're afraid we might get hurt, there is part of you, I, I have to believe there's part of you that longs for that. And that longing is not an accident. It's there by design because those relationships, they are key to what we, what we need and change. You know, we want a drug, we want a miracle cure for change in our lives, a pill that we can take and that we wake up in the morning, a new person, the person we've always longed to be. But change is a lifelong endeavor with others. Let me say that again. Change, it is a lifelong endeavor with others. If you only take away one thing, if you only write down one thing, I hope it's this this morning, that change takes time with others. Change takes time with others. That's the bottom line of this message and really of this whole series on how we change. Change takes time with others. And this is the final message in our We Can Change series. And we've looked at Romans chapter 12 with fresh eyes, and we've tried to understand how our cultural lens, our cultural framework has trained us to think that change primarily happens in our, in our left side of our brain, in more information, willpower, active cognition, that that's where change takes place. And we've forgotten about this whole right brain, imaginative, creative, relational part of who God has designed us to be that is actually drives change much more so than the slow track left part of our brain. That if we want to grow in Christ's likeness, if we want to develop in that way, we've got to engage our whole brain, our whole of who God has made us to be, an integral part of us. And in this final message, we want to get really practical on how do we do that together? How does that actually work out together? And that's what actually Paul does here in Romans chapter 12. He develops the metaphor of the body, the picture of the whole community together. 
And, and he walks through, and in the first couple of verses, he gives this picture of how change works, this renewal of our mind, this presenting of our bodies as a, as a living sacrifice. And then he develops this body metaphor in verses 3 through 8 about how there's different gifts and, and how we, we work together. And we looked at then how does, what is the thing that prevents change? How do we get stuck in, in not changing? And we looked at this idea of, it, of this thinking too highly of ourselves that cuts us off from this community of people who can help us to change, to see our blind spots, to help us to grow. And now in this, this final message in verses 9 through 20, Paul, 9 through 21, Paul just gets really practical about how the community belongs to and loves one another. And that's what we want to do. We want to get practical with Paul on how do we do this together? How do we change together? And verses 9 through 21 is a whole collection that Paul gives. They're just really just kind of short, one-liner kind of instructions on how we're to live together, how we're to change together, how we're to share our new life together in Jesus. And remember that change, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time with others. Change takes time with others. And as we look at these instructions, these encouragements that Paul gives us here in Romans chapter 12, we're going to organize them, because there's a lot of them, under kind of three big headings this morning. First is committed presence. The second is shared practices. And the third is spirit empowerment, the spirit's power. So presence, practices, and the power of the spirit. That's what we want to kind of unfold uh, and, and look at those under this heading. And so Paul starts this new section in Romans chapter 12 with a command. He says in verse 9, let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Or as other translations put it, let love be sincere or let love be without hypocrisy. We want a true, genuine, sincere love for one another. And many experts on the book of Romans who study this, who have made their, their life a time, effort of studying this book, they point out that this, that, that first command, verse 9, let love be sincere, let it be genuine, that that is the, the sort of the heading for everything else that comes in the rest of chapter 12 here, which makes sense if we look back to the beginning of this series, what changes us, right? It, it's not information plus willpower, it's being loved. Love is what changes us love and belonging. So it makes sense here that Paul says, let love be sincere. Let love be genuine. The experience of receiving and giving love then leads to lasting change. And genuine and sincere love, it requires committed presence. It requires committed presence. You have to be committed to the people you are with in community to bear out that love over time. Love doesn't happen without committed presence. And Paul uses this little phrase, one another, many times, throughout his writings, and in particular here at the end of the book of Romans. You can't change over time with others if you aren't committed to one another. And Paul uses that little one another phrase three times here in Romans chapter 12. He'll use it four or five more times in the book of Romans. And again, it's across the New Testament. And it is so key because nearly every one of the instructions that Paul gives us here in Romans chapter 12, I think maybe, maybe with the exception of one, it, it's, it's, it's a plural. It's addressed to the whole community. Um, in English, we just have the word you and your, and they're the same whether you're speaking to one person or a whole group of people. So sometimes we read the Bible by ourselves, and we think we read you, and we think Paul's just talking to me as an individual, but he's saying you all. And we have that kind of in our English language, maybe not a plural you, but we have you all. And so this is addressing the whole community. We could translate this whole passage with you all. Let all your love be genuine. You all abhor what is evil. You all hold fast to what is good. You all love one another with brotherly affection. You all outdo one another in showing love. You all do not be slothful. You all be fervent in spirit. You all serve the Lord. You all rejoice in hope. You all be patient in tribulation. You all be constant in prayer. You all contribute to the needs of the saints and show hospitality. You get the point. I'm not going to read through the whole passage, but in every one of those places in Romans chapter 12 here where it says, you add you all. He's talking to the whole. So you get my point. What's, what's Paul's point here? Well, just like there's no I in team, there's also no I in one another. Just like there's no I in team, there's no I in one another. Our tendency is to read those one another instructions in the Bible and hear them as a command to me individually to do something. I need to love one another. I need to love one another. But that doesn't even grab grammatically work, right? We, I don't love one another. We, we love one another. 
it takes another to love one another. One anothering requires a we. It requires not just me doing or giving, but also me receiving from others. It is a mutual, interactive exchange in relationship. And if you're going to love one another, that means, yes, I must love you, but you also, I must allow you to love me. And that's sometimes the hardest thing for us, is we are willing to serve other people, but we won't allow ourselves to be served. We won't open up and let others in. That takes committed presence for that to happen. Change happens over time with one another. And specifically, Paul mentions here loving one another and outdoing one another in honor and living with one another in harmony. Literally, to think about one another in the same way. That's the idea of harmony. There's this, this the sameness of thinking, this oneness of thinking. Not, not uniformity, but a unity in our thinking. And change takes time with us. I've heard so many stories in our church, uh, your stories, stories of struggle and shame, addiction and fear. And as you've joined community groups, as you've joined men's and women's Bible studies, as you've entered into a relationship that God has begun to change you over time, with others. I've heard so many stories, been a part of so many stories like that where someone comes and they're struggling, they're hurt, they're lonely, they're sad, and they enter into community and they begin to change over time with others. But let's get practical with this because it's hard, right? During, actually, let me just tell you, can I just be honest with you? Can I just be transparent with you in this moment? When I was writing this sermon, I got a text message from someone He's going through some really difficult things. And he said, I'd love to give you an update. And uh, can I, can, it would be easier, can I just give you a call? I'm in the middle of writing this sermon. And I will be honest, my first thought in that moment was, you know, I should text him and say, can I call you back in a few hours after I'm done writing this sermon? Because, you know, I, I'm really deep into thinking about this sermon on, on how I'm supposed to be loving with one another and, and sort of serve one another and be with there. I, I'm really deep into working on this message, how we need to be committed to each other, and I really don't have time to talk right now. It's like, Ouch. Thankfully, thankfully, I caught the hypocrisy, the irony of that uh, before I sent a text message, can we talk later on this afternoon? And I said, yeah, today, right now is a great time. Give me a call. And, you know, I'm not sure how much I was able to give in that call. But I tell you what, I, I received, I received in that call as we listened and prayed about what was going on. We've got to show up for one another. We can't bail on each other at the last minute. I, I heard a story a while back of one of our community group leaders here in, at, uh, at Christ Community, and they had um, made dinner for their whole community group. Everyone was coming over, and then one by one throughout the, the day, the day of the gathering, every single person texted and canceled, and, and this person was left with all this food that they had made and prepared. Now, no one in the group knew that the others were canceling, right? And I'm sure every single one of them had, you know, a, a more or less a good reason, right? Uh, and they probably surely thought, well, you know, it's just, I'm just one person. But that kind of stuff, it's too easy for us on text message to do that, just to cancel on one another, to, to send a, a last-minute cancellation. We need a committed presence with one another. Outdo one another in your love and in your honoring one another, in your commitment, in your consistency, in your follow-up, and your being there, and you're making it better, and, and saying, I want to I wanna make the group, this, this men's group, this women's group, this Bible study, this friendship, the best that it can be. And again, consistent presence, it, it looks different. <laughs> it looks different in this time of global pandemic. Like, right, I, I, I get that it looks really different right now, so we can't just show up and be present in the same ways that we used to be able to. But that's why I love how Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrases. I love how he translates verses 12 and 13. He says, don't be, he says, don't quit in hard times, but pray all the harder. And we need that. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. And then verse 13, help needy Christians be inventive, be inventive in hospitality. Don't you love that? Be inventive in hospitality. Inventiveness is, is all about having the ability to create or design new things, to think originally. When you can't meet in person, can you meet on Zoom? When you can't be inside, can you meet outside? When, can you send a note or drop off food or have a virtual happy hour? Be inventive in hospitality. And help needy Christians. I love that he 
how he frames that as well. And, and you all as a church are doing that in incredible ways. You've been so generous and we've been able to help so many people in our congregation who have needed help. And we've been able to bless our partners uh, in the city and across the country and world with, with help financially in this time. So thank you for your incredible generosity in that. But let's not forget that neediness does not only come in material forms. And in fact, in this moment, for many in our neighborhood, in our churches, the greatest need is not finances, though it might be. And if that's you, please let us know because we want to help you. But the neediness for so many, Christian and non, right now, is in the relational realm. We're isolated. We're lonely. So when you hear help needy Christians, don't just hear material needs. Don't just hear food. Don't just hear money. Hear relationship. Here they need a phone call, a card, a text, a socially distant coffee, or conversation on a walk outside. Help one another in the need of that. Be inventive in hospitality. Help one another in neediness of every form. So we change over time with one another through committed presence and also through shared practices. We, we learn as we watch and practice this life of obeying and following Jesus together. That's kind of how this goes. We are designed to imitate one another. It's how that right brain, imaginative, relational part of us works. We learn how to do this as we watch one, as we share our practice together. When you pray together, when you study the Bible together, when you serve together, when you work out marriage and friendship and relational problems and work problems, when you do that together, you begin to learn and imitate one another in Christ's likeness. There is a transformative power that you cannot simply get on your own. Even you can't get with your own nuclear, your, your own nuclear family. We need others outside of that small circle to help us to learn Christ's likeness. But the shared practice that Paul spends more time on here in Romans chapter 12 than any other, and all of these things he listed out are things that we do together, right? You, you serve together, you love one another together, you outdo one another together, all of that is togetherness. But the one command that Paul spends more time on than any of the others is on this idea of loving your enemy. Loving your enemy. And I think he spends more time, because it's the hardest, it requires the most practice together, because loving our enemy reflexively is not at all natural to us. Dallas Willard has said that the mark of a mature follower of Jesus is a spontaneous, non-retaliatory love of enemy. Spontaneous, non-retaliatory love towards our enemy. That that's the mark of discipleship. Uh, listen again to verses 17 uh, through 21, but in the message paraphrase. Again, I think Eugene Peterson helps us hear this with, with fresh ears. He says, don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everyone. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll be the judge, God says. I'll take care of it. Verse 20, our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. That sort of response to enemy is so unnatural to us in our, our fallen sinful state that it requires lots and lots and lots of shared practice to develop that together. Now, you might be listening, the, the enemy language might sound extreme. Do I have enemies, Bill? I mean, maybe out there, but like, but that enemy language, maybe we hear that and that sounds extreme. When am I going to encounter an enemy that I have to respond like this? Until you define enemy this way. If you begin to think of enemy as anyone who feels like they're not on your side in the moment, that's all an enemy is. Someone who feels like they're not on, on your side, who feels like you're not together with. And then all of a sudden you begin to see, I've got enemies all throughout my day. That There are all kinds of moments, whether it's with a coworker, with a roommate, with a brother or sister, or with a classmate, where they feel like they are not on my side, that we are not together, they are against me in this moment. How do you respond to those people who feel like they are not on your side, whoever they are? That's the mark of discipleship. When those in your church community, when those in your community group, your Bible study, your friends here at church, when they feel like they're not on your side, how do you respond? 
those moments will reveal more about your character, more about your formation in Christ, more about who you're becoming in Jesus than anything else. I love how Jim Wilder puts this in his outstanding book, Renovated. He says, healthy spiritual maturity requires exercise. It requires practice. We exercise by actively attaching to our enemies with love. Churches that grow disciples consistently test their attachment skills in moments when people are not on our side. He says, the church has done the most damage at exactly this point as well. When we try to win, we lose. When we learn to attach with love, we mature. We stick with others as God sticks with us. This work of the shared practice of loving those who feel like they are not on our side is such a core to growing in the depth of discipleship with Jesus and becoming the kind of people who will be like him in the world. In Christian community, we practice loving those who feel like they're not on our side, and we stick with others as God sticks with us. So change, it takes time with others in committed presence and shared practices, and finally, in the Spirit's power. Now look at verse 11. Many English translations, including the English Standard Version, which is what we most often use here on on Sunday morning in our preaching and teaching, uh, they translate verse 11 like this. Do not be slothful in zeal, and then be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. But there's a question in how do you translate that verse? Um, Do you translate it with a lowercase s, meaning the human spirit, let my spirit be fervent? Or is it a capital S? Is this the Holy Spirit, the person, God, the Holy Spirit, who's on reference? And there isn't a broad consensus, honestly, but I think there's a strong case that's actually to be made that what Paul is intending here is not our human spirit primarily, but actually the Holy Spirit. And I listen to how Douglas Moo, who's probably one of the top scholars alive today on the book of Romans, how he translates verse 11. He says this, In zeal do not be lazy, be set on fire by the Spirit. That's the idea of fervency. Be set on fire by the Spirit, serve the Lord. And I think Mu is right. I think what Paul is saying here is let the Spirit energize. Let the fervency of the Holy Spirit empower you to this work. Be set on fire by the Spirit. Because we need the power of the Spirit to encourage us, empower us, and sustain us over the long, hard work of changing together. Because human community by itself it's, it's just like a two liter of Coke. Now, now stay with me. Where, where are you going with this? Human community, mere human community is like a bottle of Coke. There are lots of merely human communities we are a part of, our work, school, sports, civic, neighborhood. They are all shaping us and forming us whether we realize it or aware of it or not. We are a part of many, many merely human communities. But there is only one community that can change you into Christ likeness. You can form you into Christ's likeness, and that is the community that is empowered by the Spirit. Okay, so here's the deal. What about the Coke? Why did you mention the Coke? Well, ordinary human community is like that bottle of Coke, but the church is like the bottle of Coke with, right, the Mentos that are added to it. It's this power, this effervescence, this releasing, this, this boiling over. That's literally what the language of being fervent is, boiling over. That's what the Spirit does to a merely human community. It empowers it, it energizes it, releases uh, it in ways that by itself it could never be. And if you've never seen uh, Mentos being dropped into a bottle of Coke, just Google that, um, and you'll see what I mean by boiling over effervescence. Okay, so here at the end, let let me conclude with this. We were designed to change together over time, empowered by the Spirit. Only when you have the power of the Spirit, this new life in Jesus, the Spirit dwelling, will this change happen. And if you are a part of a community group uh, or any kind of group here at church, a men's study, a women's study, a group of friends who just get together for coffee and pray and there's no formal name on it, but you just gather and you support one another, you call, you text, whatever it is that you do. If you're a part of a group like that at our church, don't give up. I know the pandemic has made this incredibly challenging. It's hard to be together. There's more reasons to not than ever before. There's so much uphill. But don't give up. Keep committing to those relationships. Keep showing up. Keep pressing in. Keep learning. Keep imitating one another as you imitate Christ. Keep learning together. Don't give up on this even though it's hard. I know it's hard. Stay committed to those relationships. 
Don't stop fighting for committed presence. Be inventive in hospitality. And if you're not a part of something like that, do whatever it takes to join something like that. Find a friend who you can get together with and go on a walk. Join a community group. Invite people over to your front yard for a socially distant time of just enjoying dessert. Even if you have to do a a virtual happy hour over Zoom, whatever it is, find a way to connect with other people in the church, the community empowered by the Spirit. Be inventive in that, but do whatever it takes. You need it now more than ever. You always need it, but now you need it more than ever. And you can't make lasting change without it. And what's more, there are people right now who are missing out on what you are going to bring into their life, how God is going to use you in their life if you're not connected to others in our church community. Not only are you missing out, but there are other people in our church family who are missing out on what God uniquely wants to do in those relationships through you. And let me just close with the story of someone who did this. There's a couple in our church, Caleb and Suji, who joined Christ Community during the pandemic. I've actually got a, a picture of them here. And we were not meeting in person. They moved here from Denver, Colorado, in the middle of the stay-at-home orders. Our Sunday morning services were shut down. We were completely online. They found our online services, and they started watching. And they reached out to us as pastors, and they said, hey, we moved here. We want to join a community group. And so we, we got them connected, and they joined a community group, and they started going to this community group regularly, even though they had never been to our building. They had never been to an in-person service. And then back on July 12th, when we launched in-person services, they came to a service. For the very first time, they stepped into this building. They stepped into church. But they were so committed to being in relationship, to finding a church home, to connecting with others in community. That they didn't wait. I mean, it would have been easy for them, right? It would have been easy for Caleb and Suji to be like, okay, we just moved. Let's get settled. Once churches start opening up with services again on Sundays, we'll start checking them out. But they didn't. They started watching online, and they say, we want to get involved. They started meeting with a community group in a backyard before they ever had a chance to set foot in this building. Who does that, right? I'll tell you who does that. It's people who are committed to change with others over time, who are committed to following Jesus, to learning from him with others over time. May the Spirit's empowerment, may he empower each and every one of us with the committed presence of Jesus and his people to be together, changing with others over time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, would you help us in this work of committed presence, of being together, changing over time. Do this work. Give us the strength to keep going, to endure in this time. This is an opportunity for your church to be all that you've called us to be. Would you find us faithful? In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit who empowers us and intercedes for us. Amen. thank you again for joining us for our online service. And if you are newer to our online services, please reach out to us as as pastors. We'd love to help connect you just like we were able to connect Caleb and Suji. Uh, If you want to join and be a part of a community group or even do that virtually, we'd, we'd love to connect you in some way. So if online is the primary way you're engaging, maybe you're new to Christ community in this way, Reach out to us. Let us know uh, that you're watching. We want to care for you. We want to support you, uh, connect with you in this way. And as you all who are watching this uh, prepare to go to the work and the callings that Jesus has on your life this week, let me send you with this benediction from Romans chapter 15. You can extend a hand if, if you like to receive this. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father. 
our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace to love and serve him this week.